I already told you the verse, John 10, 10, the last part. The first part says, the thief or the devil comes not but to kill and to destroy. And then Jesus says, I am come, John 10, 10, be the last part, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. It was the Lord's desire to give you eternal life and to give you a new man, a new life, and for you to live this life in a different perspective than those who don't have Christ have. And I want to ask you this question. How do you live your day? What is your outlook on your day? How is your life? Are you applying the principles of the Word of God to have an abundant life? Or do you have a life that's in the gutter? Do you have a life that is a life of drudgery? A, be a believer has no uh, reason at all to have a drudgery life. Right? Just for the very, if everything was bad in your life, just the sake that you have Jesus Christ in your heart should be enough to put a smile on your face in any, at any time. Just, just the idea that you have eternal life, just the idea that you know that you're going to spend eternity in heaven, you know, should be able to get you through 80 years or whatever. Just that idea should, should make you have a smile on your face. But we're talking about this idea of an abundant life. The Lord intended us to have a life that was full and had purpose and had meaning and had joy and a more abundant life that Christ desired us to have. By the way, let me just say it, make, make it very clear, because it's a huge doctrine that is misinterpreted from the Word of God. God did not intend all believers to be rich. That is wrong. You remember that Christ often exalted the faith of those who had hardly anything. That if uh, 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 widows who had very little, and a widow's might, boy, the, the widow's might, the lady with the widow's might, the widow's penny, where Christ exalted her and said she's given more than all, Oh, she must have been an ungodly lady if godliness means that God has to give you riches, as you hear on television, as you see in the bookstore. No, it is not God's intention, and it is not God's will that everybody have loads of money, and that everybody even be rich, and that everybody even be prosperous or above average rich. God has promised to supply all our needs and to give us those things which are beneficial to us. But it is His, His, His desire that we have joy in our life. And it is his desire that we have a full life. You remember what the scripture says, and I believe it's 1 John. It says, these things have I written unto you, that your joy may be full. His desire was that we would have a joyful life. He gives us a new life and wants to live it abundantly. And Proverbs, if you turn there, please, is a book on living life, on how to live life. It's a lot of very general statements. We have tried to take them topically and tried to, to, te to teach you, a believer, about how to apply some of these things or what they mean. Uh, the book of Proverbs teaches us how to have life the Lord intended us to have, a blossoming and a first, fur, uh, uh, fur, I think uh, Gary got me spluttered up tonight. <laughs> flourishing, flourishing life. Doesn't mean you're not going to have trials. Do Christians have trials? The whole book of First and Second Peter is written to Christians with trials. <coughs> My brethren, count it all joy when you, ha when you fall in diverse temptations. Remember this? Knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work that you may be per perfect. And I'm, I didn't mean to quote this and I didn't write it down. But the idea is that you, that you should allow trials to come to your life and praise God when they come. Another passage talks about that they are more precious than gold, that perishes. Trials are not something that we're supposed to be drained from a Christian's life. God uses hard times. But it does mean, it doesn't mean to have an abundant life that you won't have trials and, and hard times, but it does mean that God desired that our life would be God-structured, God-controlled, that uh, our attitudes would be purp purpose-filled, that we would please Him and that He would give us joy and that our lives would bless others. A, an abundant life is a life that is joyful within our hearts, that pleases God, makes Him joyful, and that makes other people blessed and joyful. That's an abundant life. Our Christian lives can be abundant if we will follow the book of Proverbs, and we've seen many things on this so far. We're looking specifically at verses in Proverbs that have the word life in them. You remember that some verses in Proverbs have the word life, and they specifically talk about something that's coming in the future, which is our what? Yell it out. Right, our eternal life. But most of the verses in Proverbs that talk about life, you can see by the context and by the fact that the book of Proverbs is a book on living life, that it's talking about your living right now, not just about your eternal life, about how to live right now. 
We've already seen in the verses of Proverbs, the abundant life comes from fearing the Lord. We saw that over many weeks. From practicing God's righteousness. Righteousness being fulfilling my obligations to God and to people. You know, to have a, I can't have an abundant life when I'm ripping off my employer. I can't have a, an abundant life when I'm not fulfilling uh, the obligations I have to my spouse and to my children. That's part of an abundant life. A part of the joy that's going to be robbed when you are robbing God of what you should be doing for Him and robbing others of what you should be doing for them. We saw that uh, the abundant life comes from obeying godly instruction. And last, uh, we saw that uh, the abundant life comes from pursuing wisdom and understanding. And tonight, I want you to see this, that the abundant life comes from practicing self-control. From practicing self-control. You know, there's extremes in our society. And these are the extremes. You have a guy over here that is training for the Olympics or something, the Ironman contest in Hawaii or something like that. And that fella, can, he can discipline himself and he can run 17 miles and swim uh, uh, just tons of, I don't know what they're called in the ocean, but he can swim and swim and swim in the ocean and he can get on a bike and run and, and ride 75 more miles. A guy like that who disciplines himself and who is so uh, just in every area, it seems, in self-control. And you have another thought in society over here that says, do whatever you want to do. And don't hold back your body and allow your body to do whatever it wants to do. The Bible talks about self-control in Scripture, and we're going to talk about it a little bit. But I want, one thing I want to make clear about self-control in the beginning, that it does vary according to a person's character. But I'm really not talking about the self-control like, can you make yourself get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and run three miles, okay? Really, I'm talking about self-control in areas that it's impossible to have self-control in without the Lord's help, and those are spiritual areas. Specifically tonight, we're going to begin talking about two areas. We're going to talk about your thought life, and then we're going to talk about your, your talk, your speech, and how important it is that you control those areas and how they're directly connected to your joy in life and uh, the abundance of your, the abundant life or the joyful or the blossoming or the flourishing life. And getting these two things under control are very important. But I want, to, I want you to understand that it seems like men can discipline themselves in all areas, but spiritual areas are out of our control. There are spiritual areas, your thought life and your your uh, talk and many other areas, you can't do it just by self-will. A man can't be successful Christian just by self-will. I think that's why a lot of believers eventually quit and throw in the towel because they try to do it themselves and they, they find that they cannot live up to perfection. That's a, that's a really profound thought, isn't it? But of course we can. not But as I've talked to you before, and I'm not going to talk to you this long, but I want you to understand that one of the functions of the Holy Spirit that I've preached several years in this church. The Bible says, this I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the, of the flesh. One of the functions of the Holy Spirit, according to Galatians chapter 5, 16, and we see it in Romans 7 and Romans 8, especially in Romans 8. One of the functions of the Holy Spirit, when God saved us, He put this thing called a Holy Spirit inside of it. It's not a thing, it's a Him. The Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, one of His jobs is to help us to be self-controlled in spiritual areas in our lives. And we try, we can try on our own and we, go, we will fail. But the Bible talks about walking in the Spirit, and I've talked about this before, so I'm not going to talk about it long, but just this idea of understanding you can't do it yourself and of yielding control to the Holy Spirit or petitioning the Holy Spirit to help you. And there are many, many times in a day and in a week that I tell the Lord, I cannot do this, Lord. Please give me the strength of your Holy Spirit. I yield to Him. I'm going to fail unless you help me. And that is a very biblical concept. The Bible speaks of it. It's not a mystic kind of a thing, but rather a straightforward decision of your will to admit that you cannot do it, uh, accomplish spiritually what you want to accomplish without the help of the Holy Spirit. Take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 4, please, and we'll plunge into this. Failing to control ourself, whether it be thoughts or talk, leads to sorrow and leads to sadness and leads to guilt and to broken fellowship with God and despair and hurting others and etc. and etc. and etc. If I do not control myself, I'm going to do something, I'm going to say something, I'm going to think something I ought not to. 
You can see how that could wreck your abundant life. You can see how that could wreck your joyful life by not controlling yourself. And tonight we're going to look at our thoughts. We must control our thoughts and our desires to have an abundant life. Now I want you to stop. I want you to shake yourself out of the Wednesday evening kind of mode. And I want to tell you this. I believe controlling your thought life is probably the most important part of having a joyful and abundant life. I really do. The more that I think about this and the more that I study about it and the more that I look at it in the Word of God, the reason, the main reason that our abundant and joyful life gets messed up is because our thoughts get out of hand and they run in places they should not run. I don't only mean straightforward bad thoughts, evil thoughts, I just mean unbiblical thoughts or thoughts about God and about Him taking care of you that in your mind you doubt or in your mind you question or in your mind you entertain thoughts of worry or you entertain thoughts of impurity or you entertain thoughts of criticism or you entertain thoughts of anger or entertain thoughts of bitterness. All of these, jealousy, whatever, envy, all are unbiblical thoughts that rob your joy. When you allow these things to go unchecked, and honestly, some of our minds are we're like a, 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 one of those out in the West, those, those fenced-in round pens where wild mustangs are put in. You ever seen on movies, the wild, some of you have been on ranch, you see the wild mustangs are kicking and they're jumping all over the place and slamming against the fence and they don't want to be in there and they want to get out as soon as they can get out and they don't want to be contained. Some of our minds, if you could open up our minds, they're like that sometimes. All the thoughts are allowed to just run rampant. And no wonder it sucks the abundant life out of us and the joy out of us. We must control our thoughts and desires to have an abundant life. Look at Proverbs chapter 4 and verse number 23. The first verse we look at tonight says this. It says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the, what's the next word? Issues, Issues of life. Let me say that again. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Out of your heart are the issues of your life. I use this verse on Sunday when speaking about wrong influences. Most of you have heard this verse before. Raise your hand if you've heard this verse before. You heard this verse. Okay, some of you have, some of you haven't. It's uh, used it when it's talking about wrong influences. You see it says there, keep thy heart. Keep thy heart with all diligence. To keep means to guard or to protect. Protect your heart. Protect what gets into your heart. Obviously, this is not a message or a verse on cholesterol, okay? This is, uh, this is something that is talking spiritually, all right? Guard or protect your heart with all diligence. I'll say this later, but our thoughts are kind of like computer files that we type up on our computer or send to us email that we save or we download. Our heart, speaking of our heart, is part of our character. It's like a hard drive that is within us all the time. And those thoughts, whatever those inputs are, they're stored on our heart. And as they're stored on our heart, if they're corrupt files, they corrupt our what? Our heart. It's something, uh, 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 a, your heart is something that is static within you, your inner man. Um, it has a lot to do with your thoughts. But your thoughts and influences are things that are written down on the hard drive of your heart. And your heart is what you become. God lets us know that it's imperative situation and very important to guard your inner man, your inner thoughts, your desires, your inner mind, your heart. This is a part of you that you only you and God knows what is on your heart. It's something that you don't share with people. It's generally something that if we would put it on parade that you may be ashamed of. How many of you would be willing that I would uh, open up your spiritual heart and let everybody know what's written on the heart? Nobody would want to do that, would we? We'd be very embarrassed about that. It's something that we all struggle with at different times. We wouldn't let anyone know that. God knows that. The phrase says, all diligence. Keep thy heart with all diligence. That, that word is used in other places in the Bible to describe uh, a, a prison guard that is stationed to not allow anything through the gate. It's literally used and translated as prison or prison guard in different places. 
So the idea is protect or guard your heart with the diligence of a soldier or a guard that would be at a prison gate who wouldn't allow anything in or anything out, that it was his job, that you, you were very serious and very diligent about it. It's not something. Sometimes we don't think that influences are going to bother us. How many of us have heard before, well, I can handle that, okay? Or maybe you've thought that. You know, one of the biggest lies, and I'm, I'm getting ahead of my message, but one of the biggest lies and how foolish it is to say, I wouldn't show this to my child, but I would watch it. Why do we say that? You know, we've, we've taken that off of the cue of ratings and things like that on movies and different things, that there's a certain level that it's okay to see evil things. Now, which level is that? When I'm 38, or when I'm 58, or when I'm 68, or when I'm 18? Where is it in the Bible that God says, as long as you're 18, you can see this, or you can put this influence in your mind, or you can hear these words, or you can see this violence. It's okay to you, and it won't affect you. Why do we do that? Those little children are just going to grow up. Why does it matter? And I'm challenging your thinking. What difference is it if I feed my seven-year-old something or I feed my own heart? Is it bad for him but good for me? Well, he can't handle it. I have news for you. This verse says you can't handle it. Keep your heart. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Be careful what goes in there. Be a prison guard that won't thing, let things through the gate. God wants our inner man to be free from lies, uh, bad influences, wrong philosophy, things that hurt your faith. What do you think will happen if you put a steady diet? Let me just, let me pull one out of the blue. If I put a steady diet of evolution and evolutionary programs and evolutionary reading and evolutionary scientific whatever uh, in my mind, and I don't put any of the creation scientist research or, or any of those in, I just put over here all these influences constantly, year after year after year. I read them, I read them, I watch things, I go to seminars. I what do you think eventually is going to happen? I'm, do you think my faith in, in a literal six-day creation is going to be troubled after a while? Definitely, definitely. And if somebody here thinks I'm too strong for that, please understand what the Bible's saying. Out of your heart, what you put in your heart, eventually the issues of life come out of it. What you are and how you react to life will come out of it. So if I put negative thoughts, if I put angry and bitter influences, if I put impurities or lies or bad influences or things that hurt my faith or things that contradict the Bible constantly in it, I am going to be affected. I'm going to be affected. How do they get into our hearts? Well, only two ways. Only two ways. Number one, they come in, we create them by our own imagination. You create things, you create files for your own heart. You write computer files for your own heart. You know, it's a wonderful thing about man, you can create evil inside of you. I don't, know, I don't think it's wonderful, I think it's pretty bad. But man is full of wicked imaginations. He can create uh, any uh, fantasy or any idea or any doubt or any misconception about God or any faith buster that he wants to on the inside. And continual thinking about that faith buster eventually is going to bust your faith. Okay, So the first way you get things inside of you that you shouldn't get inside of you is through your imaginations. But then through letting things influences in, like kind of what we we're speaking about on Sunday, through the gates of experience. The gates of our experience, the eye gate and the ear gate are the two main ones. But then also, you know, other experiences of touch and smell. And, and these, these are gates. These are gates that we ought not allow things in, taste. We, uh, we want to think we are strong enough to handle destructive influences. But God says, keep your heart. Keep your heart. Guard it with all diligence. Don't allow things in your eyes and in your ears or in your touch. That are things that are contrary to the Word of God. Don't think I can handle it, or I want to be a Renaissance man. That a Renaissance man, is something that wants to experience everything, or be a part of everything, or involved in everything. All right, God says that's wrong. You can you can choose that worldly philosophy, but God says it's wrong. You're to keep your heart, keep your heart. Like a faithful prison guard, the goal is nothing goes through the gate that is not pleasing to God. That's pretty simple, isn't it? 
Nothing will go through this gate or through this, these ears that is not pleasing to God. You know, David said he made a covenant with his eyes that he would not look on a maid in an impure way. That's what David said. He said, I made a covenant with my eyes. You know, how do you make a covenant with your eyes? Listen, eyeballs, we're going to make an agreement here. The Bible says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. We need to take serious this matter of our gates. We are hypocrites, as I said, when we shield evil things from our children, yet we ingest it for ourselves. Even adults must keep our hearts. Notice why, okay? You with me? Look at the Bible. Notice why. Let's say uh, Proverbs 4.23, the last part of it together. It starts with four. Here we go. For out of it are the issues of life. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it, out of your heart, not this fleshly pumping thing, but your, the hard drive of your memories and the hard drive of your influences and the hard drive of your imaginations, out of this inner man are the issues of of your life as the physical heart pumps blood to all parts of the body okay as my heart today tonight pumps things out my arm and to my hands and I don't have very good circulation so it's not pumping good enough down to my toes you know and all over my body so our spiritual heart pumps to the acts your actions and your words come from your heart Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 that a good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good things. That means that my mouth is filthy because my heart is filthy. We say, oh, that's just a habit. Yeah, it's a habit that's been written on the hard drive of your heart. You know, my thoughts are impure because they're written on my heart. My mouth is negative because I have a negative and a critical heart. Over time, I have written onto that thing. And it's going to take a long time of keeping in order to erase those things or to change those things. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. As the physical heart pumps blood to all parts of the body, so the spiritual heart pumps, at to the, pump, pumps your heart to your actions and your words and to your attitudes and all the decisions of your life. Every relationship, every con conversation, every activity comes the way you react to things. You ever wonder why one guy reacts one way to something and another guy under the exact same circumstances reacts completely a different way? It's because of their heart. It's because of what over time they have written on their hearts. If that spiritual heart is tainted and negative and sinful and dishonest, so are the actions. What we do and say proceeds directly from who we are in the heart. Proverbs 23 verse 7, the first part says this, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Think, that, think about that. Think how deep that is. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You can do it backwards. Why are you the way that you are? Because that's what is on your heart. And so some of us wonder, you know, why am I struggling so much with the joy of my life? Why am I struggling with abundance of life? Why am I struggling with this and you know, why doesn't God just make me joyful and abundant and whatever? It's because we, over a period of time, have continually written things on our heart. And what comes out of our mouth and what comes out in our thoughts and what comes out in our actions and what comes out in our joy is just what's on our heart. Turn to Proverbs 14 and verse number 30. Proverbs 14 and verse number 30. Bible says in Proverbs 14 and verse number 30, A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. This is speaking both physically and spiritually. Let's read it again. Think it through. A sound heart is, li is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. It's true both in the physical and the spiritual heart. If your ticker is strong, it makes for a strong body. The blood goes where it should go, okay? Again, I'm thinking about my dad tonight. They're hooking three wires to his heart because it won't keep time right, and, and, and sometimes it just stops. That's not good when your ticker just stops, by the way. That generally means there's something wrong, okay, Brother Green? You just remember that. All right. The, uh, if you're strong, if your, your, your heart is strong physically, your heart is strong, 
then you're going to get the circulation that you need. And, and generally, those things that deal with circulation and blood flow and all, you know, it, it strengthens the rest of your body. Also, if your spiritual ticker is strong, your life will be strong and blessed because you aren't continually bringing yourself trouble from the actions of a corrupted heart. If your spiritual heart is strong, if the hard drive of your memory and your thoughts and what you will tolerate as far as your thinking and as far as your belief and, start, and as far as things that you mull over, I don't even know if that's the right word, but it means it's like chewing your cud over and over and over. All right, that is going to come out in your life. It is going to, uh, all parts of your flesh, all parts of your life, it's going to come out of. Notice the illustration in the end of the verse uh, of something bad that comes from the heart that affects the rest of your life. What is it? Yell it out. What is it in the end of the verse? Envy. Okay, and then it makes an application here, talking about the heart. But it says, uh, it says, but envy the rottenness of the bones. If there is envy in your heart, guess what happens? It spreads throughout your life. Spreads throughout your life. Here's an example of an unguarded heart that this fella, by envy. Give me another word for envy. Yell it out. I'm glad we don't do this on Sunday because it would be pandemonium in here, wouldn't it? Jealousy. All right, somewhere along the line, this guy has gotten jealous of something. Maybe his buddy, who's only worked there, you know, for two years, and he's worked there for four years, his buddy got the promotion. And this guy's envious, and this guy's jealous. Or this guy gets a better parking place, or whatever it is. Or, I don't know, you apply to your situation. But he's allowed envy, and he's allowed jealousy in his, uh, in his heart. And that envy has worked itself out of the heart. To, and the illustration is that it's now rotting the bones. It's worked itself out of his inner man, and it's now rotting everything in his life. His envy is affecting his relationship at home, to his children, to his marriage. You, you, you ever know anybody that's eaten up by jealousy and bitterness? Say amen if you have. Amen. All right, some of you woke up there. Amen. Okay, yes, it affects everything. I've told you before about the teenage girl that came to me one time about 10 years ago. Asked if she could talk to me. And she said, what's wrong with you? I said, what do you mean what's wrong with me? What's wrong with you? Something wrong with you. You're just eating everybody up, chewing them up, spitting them out. You're mean as a junkyard dog. What's wrong with you? Something's not right with you. What she didn't know is I was bitter at somebody. And that wasn't just affecting my relationship with that person. It was affecting everybody, everything. All right, listen, when you allow things to be written on your heart, your heart, your heart, and your heart, don't question why you don't have an abundant life. It's coming out. That stuff's coming around. That stuff's coming back at you, right? All right. Folks, what you put into your heart, what you create in your heart by imagination is who you become. Your thoughts are like computer files. Your heart is like a hard drive uh, where uh, things, those thoughts, and those memories are saved. And what happens, we regurgitate those thoughts, those bad thoughts, or unfaithful thoughts, or doubtful thoughts, or worryful thoughts, or, or evil thoughts, or perverted thoughts. Or, you know, you can apply this to any area of thoughts and of imagination. And we let them run in our, our mind. And, you know, we're wondering when our, you know, oh, so, you know, my... My son or my grandson's taking a trip and, you know, oh, I hope he's going to, you know, there's a little water on the road and, you know, I just don't know. I hope he's not going to wreck and, you know, and I can imagine all these, oh, I hope no one runs into him. You know, I hope he doesn't, you know, big bird come down. And I hope, you know, and, I hope, and some of you let, that's just one example of worry, but you let these thoughts over and over and over. And the Bible says that's recorded on your heart. It may be another area, the negativity. Man, I can't believe they're doing that. can't believe they're doing that. Over and over and over and over. How many times do you think that when people mull on things that they repeat them in their thoughts? I think we would be surprised to think that probably the human being can regurgitate something, a negative thought, probably thousands of times in one day. And that is writing on your heart over and over and over and over. And that's affecting your joy in life. Say, Pastor, what do I do about it? Please take your Bibles and turn out of Proverbs to 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse number 5. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse number 5. I want to tell you very, just straightforwardly, if you can imagine, let's just say you, it's jealousy. 
You write that thing on your heart 10,000 times a day over a period of two weeks. Somebody do the math. I don't know how many of that times that is. But I want to tell you, you don't work out of that by one Bible verse and one trip to the altar. You understand what I'm saying? You have a negative spirit and you're always complaining, complaining, complaining in your home and in your church and in your workplace. And you're just a negative kind of person, critical kind of person. And you've been that for years and you've been that millions of times and you've thought millions of of uh, critical thoughts, you don't work that out with one sermon, okay? Habits take good habits to break. Do you understand what I mean? The, e the evil thinking, the jealous thinking needs to be written over. And the first step to that is you got to get control of the jealous thinking or the negative thinker, or the perverted thinker, or whatever it is. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, verse number 5. Look what it says. It says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the, what's the next word? Obedience, Obedience of Christ. All right, here is instruction, and here is power, and here is the first thing to do. You can't let your thoughts, your unbiblical thoughts, run in your mind like wild mustangs. You must bring them into, what's the verse say? Captivity. Yell it out. What is it? Come on. Captivity. Preach this with me. Captivity. They've got to be brought into captivity. I cannot allow the negative thinking just to run at will, and yet we do. A man who allows impure thinking to run in his mind is a pervert right? It must be checked. A lady who allows complaining thoughts run in her mind is a critical lady. It must be checked. It must be brought into captivity. You know what that means? You grab a hold of that thought immediately when you're having it and cut it off. Stop it. Do not allow it to continue. Ephesians lays down the principle of replacement, that what you put off you need to replace. That thought needs to be replaced either with a wholesome verse or a wholesome thought. But you can't allow it to run. Maybe there's somebody, uh, somebody in your life that you just don't like, and maybe you have a lot of reason not to like her or him. But if you allow that to continue to think, you think about her in a negative way again and again and again and again, you are going to imprint that on your heart. You've got to, you've got to bring that into captivity. And I love the end of the verse. Look what it says again and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know what that means? Every thought in my mind must obey what Christ says. Okay? So let me give you an example of that. I feel like God has forsaken me. Is that an obedient thought? No. So am I, am I supposed to think about that 20 times today? No. Well, I'm supposed to, first word of the verse, I'm supposed to do what? Cast it down and bring it into captivity. All right? And again, as I told you, Ephesians says, I need to put off and put on. How many of you are familiar with those Ephesian verses of put off and put on? I need to replace that with a positive thought. I must not allow myself to have continual thoughts that run in my mind like wild Mustangs. You say, Pastor, uh, you know, what are the, what's the end of these things? How does this affect my peace? We'll turn over to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and we're done. Our Proverbs verses on controlling our heart teach us that if we uh, allow ungodly, ungodly thoughts in any form to run free within us, eventually what will happen is they will form on our heart and they will affect every area of life. All right? I'm not supposed to allow thoughts of anger and impurity and jealousy and bitterness and criticism and complaining and doubt and fear and insecurity and hopelessness and other thoughts to contradict Christ. I'm not supposed to allow them to run through my mind. Look what the Bible says in, Ephes or in, excuse me, in Philippians chapter 4. I just want to read this and then, and then we're done. In fact, won't you stand with me, please? The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, beginning of verse number 5, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful. That's full of care. That doesn't mean watching so you don't slip on water. Be full of care for nothing. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer 
Okay, we're talking about mental things here. We're talking about our minds and our hearts. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the, what's the next word? Peace. Peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When I handle thoughts the way that I'm supposed to handle thoughts, then the peace of God. See, here's a problem. Many of us want God to, to force his peace on us. But the word of God says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You know, Scott can't allow to let the peace of God rule in his mind and in his heart if his mind and his heart is full of worry. The peace of God can't rule in his heart. It's pushing, the, the heart is overrun with thoughts of worry. The thoughts of like Mustangs are running all over the place. But look at the next verse. It says, finally, brethren, still talking about this matter of the thoughts, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. The things that are in this list. Don't think on critical things. Don't think on impure things. Don't think on negative things. Don't think on doubtful things. Don't think on skeptical things. Don't think on things that are unbiblical. Don't think, bring every thought to the obedience of Christ, this verse is talking about. But then the next verse, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. In verse number 9 and in verse number 7, both words are talking about, both verses deal with the peace of God being with me. And all the verses are talking about that peace comes when I think about the right kind of things. When I allow, when I control my thoughts, when I bring it into captivity and will not allow the wrong kind of thoughts. And let me just tell you this. I know by great experience that this is much harder said than done. When I told you a little while ago, habits like 10-year-old habits of the way you thinking dying hard, they are going to die very hard. And it may take weeks of the good habits of bringing your thoughts into captivity and replacing it with the right kind of thoughts. It may take months. But until you do this, we should not expect the peace of God to rule in our hearts. We just should not. It's not God's fault. We have written the evil in our hearts. We have allowed the thoughts that have caused the peace of God so that it cannot rule within us. It's not God's fault. He's not going to grab a hold of you and rip out that evil thought, whatever. You're not in jeopardy. There's nothing wrong with you as far as your salvation if you're saved. This is a matter of years of habits that, or weeks of habits that you've allowed to write on your heart thoughts that have written over and over and over and over that you need to grab a hold of every time every time and some of, this, some of you it's going to be a very hard battle for you but until you do this the abundant life of peace you're just not going to experience it 